Welcome to church this morning. Very glad that you would meet with us once again. Uh, we're going to be in for a fantastic time this morning. We come to the conclusion of our series, Going All In On Your Purpose. And today we're going to be talking about adding fight to your life. Because if you're ever going to possess the promises that God has for you, you're going to have to learn to fight for them. But before we do this morning, we're going to have some time of praise and worship with Patrick and Yolanda. And uh, before they come up and do uh, and sing, I uh, just wanted to say thank you to everyone that's been giving. You know, Paul made a statement, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And no doubt, I know God's blessing is upon your lives because you've been faithful in your giving. And so may you continue to do that. Our, our bank and details are going to be up on the screen now. And may you continue to faithfully give and let God's blessing be upon your life. Enjoy the service this morning.
If you have your Bibles this morning, the book of Exodus, uh, chapter 13, uh, we're going to read verse 17 and verse 18. Uh, we're currently now concluding our series uh, entitled Going All In On Your Purpose. Uh, we've been looking at this for the last five weeks and today uh, we're going to be finishing this off and we're going to be talking about something else that we need to add to our armor, add to our lives if we're ever going to live in the purpose that God has for us. God has an amazing purpose and a plan for our lives and uh, just just being able to see all that's happening in our church and the direction that God's taking us, it's undoubtedly true that we are on a journey with God and God is revealing his purpose uh, uh, for individuals slowly but surely and also for the church he's beginning to show us the great plans that he has for us and I'm super excited about all that God is going to do through your life and through my life. But today, Exodus chapter 13, uh, verse 17 to 18. Uh, and so right now we're going to look at the last thing we're going to look at that we need to add into our lives. And we're going to look at this thing called fight. That if we're going to live in the purpose that God has for us, we're going to have to learn to fight. The truth is, many a times when uh, God has a plan or God has a promise for uh, individuals, um, it is only when we begin to fight that we're able to enter into the destiny that God has for us. And we're going to read a story today of the children of Israel. You and I know the children of Israel, God had a plan for them. God had a purpose for them. God had a destiny for them. And God had this uh, uh, great destiny for the children of Israel, but they were in bondage. They were slaves. Uh, they were slaves to a nation called Egypt, and they were slaves for about 430 years. And so God shows up by sending a guy called Moses. And Moses goes and he begins to stand before Pharaoh, the king at that time, and says to him, let my people go, right? And you know the story, you know the conversation. But right at that moment, Moses begins to let the children of Israel know that God has a plan for them, that God has a purpose for them, that God had promised their father Abraham, their father Isaac, and their father Jacob that he was going to take them and give them a land of promise called the land of Canaan. But now it had been 400 years and they hadn't seen this happen to them. They hadn't lived in their promised land and they thought God had forgotten about them. And so God shows up through Moses and begins to announce, listen, God still has a plan. God still has a destiny and God is about to fulfill his promise that he promised you. And so what happens is that the children of Israel are rescued out of Egypt uh, and on their way to the promised land, the Bible begins to tell us something very significant. It says that God could have taken them the short way or there was a shorter route that God could have taken them, but God chose to take them the long way. And he then gives the reasons why he chose to take them the long way. God chose to take them the long way because he wanted to put some fight in them because the land that they were going to go and possess they had to fight for that land and so God says I want to teach you how to fight I want to add fight into your life you've been slaves for 400 years you have a slave mentality you're subdued you're submissive but if you're going to enter into all that I have for you I'm going to have to put some fight into you and that's the same for you and I God wants to put some fight into us because we will never be able to live in our purpose, pursue our destiny, if we can't fight for it. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 to 18 says this. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine territory, although that was the shortest route. God said, if they see that they have to fight a war, they may change their minds and go back to Egypt. So God led them around the other way 
on the road through the desert towards the Red Sea. The Israelites were ready for battle when they left Egypt. This is an amazing text because it pretty much tells us this, that God knew of a shorter route. That the children of Israel didn't need to go through the wilderness. They didn't need to go through the roundabout long way. But God deliberately stopped them from going the short way. Because in case that they face a battle that they're not equipped to fight. Uh, and in their minds they change their mind and return back to slavery. So the reason why God takes them the long way is because God wants to put some fight into them. But I was reading this and it's interesting. In verse 18, towards the end of our text, says this, The Israelites were ready for battle when they left. God, hang on for a second. If they are ready for battle when they left Egypt, why is it you take them a roundabout way because you don't want them to fight or you want them to learn to fight? If they are ready for battle, why not allow them to fight? You see, the children of Israel physically, they looked ready for battle. But mentally and spiritually, they weren't ready for a fight. So in the physical sense, they were ready. They had their swords, they had their armor, they had the things that they need in order to fight. But mentally and spiritually, they weren't ready for a fight. And so God leads them through the roundabout way, the long way, the wilderness, so he could put some fight into them. So he could teach them how to fight. And here's here's a powerful truth that you and I need to learn. Is that God's promises for your life are not going to just happen automatically. Though God reveals his plan to you, it's not just going to happen. Though God can announce your purpose, uh, the purpose for your life, it's not going to be automatic. God will demand and expect you uh, to fight in order to acquire all that he has for you. This is a kingdom principle. You're going to have to fight for your promises. You're going to have to fight for your purpose. You're going to have to fight in order to fulfill God's plan for your life. Matthew chapter 11 verse 12. Here's Jesus describing John the Baptist. And he makes a statement in Matthew chapter 12, uh, chapter 11 verse 12. Listen to what he says. It says, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And the forceful people have been seizing it. And forceful people have been seizing it. You might know this scripture because in the King James Version, it says this, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent assault and violent men seize it by, uh, by force or uh, violent men seize it by force as a special, uh, as a precious price. That's what the Amplified Version says. Uh, so here's Jesus describing, actually Jesus describing John the Baptist how John the Baptist worked and uh, pursued his purpose and lived out his purpose. John the Baptist was a forerunner for Jesus. And he comes onto the scene and John the Baptist is forceful, he's aggressive, he's preaching uh, uh, the message of repentance. uh, And Jesus says that the kingdom of God is advanced uh, by men and women who have this ability to force things through. It's advanced by men and women that don't take no for an answer. Men and women that pursue destiny that are willing to fight and advance the kingdom of God. And he uses this expression to describe John the Baptist, saying that John the Baptist was a man that advanced the kingdom of God forcefully. Look at the Old Testament for a second, and you begin to realize that some of the great men and women of our faith were men and women who were willing to fight for their faith. They were willing to fight in order to advance the kingdom of God. You see church, Christianity is not a passive religion. It's a king, it's a kingdom made up of men and women who are willing to forcefully advance the kingdom of God, uh, both in a spiritual sense and a physical sense, spiritually by prayer and fasting uh, and crying out to God, uh, physically by reaching and by speaking and sharing the gospel. The kingdom of God is built by men and women who forcefully advance uh, the kingdom of God. Christianity is not passive. And so as we go back to the Old Testament, We can begin to see this truth uh, that if we're going to pursue our destiny, if we're going to live in the purpose that God has for us, uh, we're going to have to learn to fight. Just because God promised it, 
doesn't mean that you'll be able to live in it. Just because God made a promise doesn't mean that you'll be able to live in it automatically. Sometimes you're going to have to fight. A great example of this would be Caleb. God promised Caleb a land for him and his family because Caleb had trusted God in faith. Caleb had believed God when everyone else doubted God. And so now Caleb and the children of Israel have entered the territory that God has for them. And Caleb says something that's quite amazing. Joshua chapter 14, verse 10 to 12. Listen to what Caleb says. So backing up a bit, here's Caleb. Caleb knows God's promise. Caleb knows God's purpose. Caleb knows God's plans. But yet notice in this text, Caleb doesn't repray the prayer asking God to give him territory. But Caleb takes it upon himself to go and fight and acquire that which God had promised him. Takes it upon himself to fight and possess that which God had called him Two, Joshua chapter 14, verse 10 to 12 says this. Now, as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. Even while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Today, I am 85 years old. I am as strong as I was when Moses went up on that journey. And I, and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You remember that uh, you remember that as scouts or spies, we found the descendants of Achan living there uh, in great walled cities. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land, just as the Lord says. Here's Caleb. He's 85 years old, but he remembers the promise. And he begins to uh, tell Joshua, Joshua, please allow me to go possess what God promised me. Please allow me to go fight the giants. Please allow me to go and attack the fortified cities. Uh, this is talking about their strength. He says, if the Lord is with me, I'll be able to drive them out. You see, just because God promised it is not enough. Just because God has a plan for you, it's not enough. You're going to have to learn to fight in order to possess the promises God has for you. Not only are you going to have to fight to possess what God has for you, but secondly, you're going to have to learn to fight to keep possession of what God has given you. That sometimes God is going to give you things. God is going to open doors of opportunity for you. Uh, and once that door is open, uh, you're going to have to learn to fight for what belongs to you. To fight for what's in your possession. And we get a story of another guy by the name of Shama. Shama was one of David's mighty men. And in 2 Samuel 23, verse 11, here's Shama. The Philistines attack their land. They're picking up their barley. They're farmed. This is the harvest time. They've worked harder. This belongs to them. All the other men of Israel flee. They run away. But Shama says, I will not let what belongs to me be taken by an enemy. I am going to fight. It says this, uh, verse 11. Next in rank was Shammah, son of Agu of Harat. One time, the Philistines gathered Eliah and attacked the Israelites in a field full of lentils. The Israelite army fled, but Shammah held his ground in the middle of the field and beat back the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Shammah fought for what was his. Shammah fought to keep what was his. The enemy will try and attack and overwhelm us, but we need to learn to fight. We need to be bad already. We need to learn to fight for what we uh, have already. See, Christianity is not a passive religion. God doesn't want you being walked over. You and I need to learn to fight. If you will not fight, you will not possess all that God has for you. If you will not fight, you will allow the enemy to come and tell uh, to come and take from you the things that you've already possessed. Christianity is not a passive religion. In fact, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says it this way. 
For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirit in the heavenly places. Here's Paul saying, listen, you are in a fight. The moment you become a Christian, the moment you accept Christ into your life, you become a target for the enemy. And this is exactly what happens to Israel. The moment God comes and announces, now I'm leading you into destiny. Now I'm going to take you into the promise that I promised your fathers. Now we're going to go together on this journey. I am going to lead you. And it's the, at that moment when God begins to get involved in their lives that they begin to face the attacks of the enemy. So in our text, so God deliberately increases their journey time. Says, I want to put some fight in them. If I don't do this and they go the easy way or the shorter way, what's going to happen is that they might try and fight, but they're not ready to fight uh, mentally and spiritually. And if I do that, then they're going to run away. They still have what's called a slave mentality. They still have a defeatist mentality. In fact, if you read your Bible, that wilderness time, you will begin to hear the children of Israel whenever they faced any obstacle. They would begin to cry out and say, oh, I wish we could go back. Oh, in Egypt, we had this. So they had this defeatist mentality. They had a slave mentality. And so God wanted to prepare them for their destiny. And how God wanted to do this was getting them to fight. Because I mean, you know, if you fight a small battle, you're ready for the next battle. And if you fight that battle, you'll probably be ready for the next battle. And so you only get battle ready by being in smaller battles. And so God takes them the long way. And here's the truth that I want you to understand this morning. As soon as you have the call of God on your life, the moment you prayed the prayer of salvation and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the moment you began a journey with God is the moment you adopted an enemy. As soon as you begin to pursue your purpose, as soon as you begin to pursue God, you become a target for Satan. Satan doesn't want you living in your purpose. Satan doesn't want you receiving the promises of God. And Satan will become an obstacle in your way to stop you from achieving, from possessing, from acquiring the purpose that God has for your life. So you can't run away from this. The moment you get on a journey with God is the moment you adopt for yourself an enemy. So if you have an enemy, this means that you're going to have to learn to fight. I'll just let you know now, he's coming. He's probably waiting for you. And his mission is to kill, steal, and destroy. Notice in Exodus chapter 17. So here's the children of Israel. They've left Egypt. God now has, uh, has taken them the longer way. And the Bible says in chapter 17, verse 8, it says, While the children of whilst the people of Israel were still in Raphidim, the warriors of Amalek attacked them. Here they are, just minding their own business, on their way to the promised land, being led by God. And as they're on this journey with God, they are attacked. They didn't pick this fight, the fight picked them. They didn't go asking to fight, but the enemy came to attack them. And God allowed them to be attacked so they could learn to fight. And as you read the story, you realize that as they were attacked, Israel began to fight. Exodus 17 verse 13 to 15 says, In this way, Joshua totally defeated the Amalekites. Then the Lord said to Moses, write an account of this victory so that it will be remembered. Tell Joshua that I will completely destroy the Amalekites. Moses built an altar and named it. The Lord is our banner. See, so when they fight the Amalekites, Joshua wins the battle, defeats the Amalekites, and God says, write it down. Build a monument, build an altar as a reminder that you've won a battle. Why? Because God knew there was another battle coming down the road. And so if they had notes and a monument, something written down to remind them of their victory. How I many you know when you've won some fights, it gives you confidence. 
When you've won some battles, it gives you courage. When you've won some fights, it makes you a bit resilient. You have a greatness to your life. So if you've won some battles, you're confident, you're courageous, you're resilient, and bring on the next one. And so the children of Israel, God knows this, so he leads them this way, allows them to get attacked, they win the battle, and now they've got confidence. Now they've got courage. Now they've got resilience. Bring on the next fight. Nothing will give you confidence and courage and resilience like winning some fights. The enemy is going to come after your destiny. You are going to have to learn to fight. He's going to come after you. He's going to come after your relationship with God. He's going to come after your testimony. You're going to have to learn to fight. See, Satan's going to come and attack your mind. He's going to attack your relationships with people in church that God has surrounded you with. He's going to attack your family. You're going to have to learn to fight. He's going to come after your vision. He's going to attack your finances. He's going to attack your marriage. You're going to have to learn to fight. You're going to have to learn to fight for your marriage. Fight for the, uh, fight against the poverty mentality. Fight for your finances. Fight for your salvation. Fight for your mind. Fight against temptation and sin. Fight for your relationship with God because the enemy is going to come after what's valuable to you and he's gonna come and attack and you're gonna have to learn to fight for your destiny Paul tells Timothy in 1st Timothy chapter 6 verse 12 says this fight the good fight of faith in the conflict with evil take hold of the eternal life to which you were called in other words, Paul's telling this young uh, preacher, this young pastor, this young disciple, listen, fight the good fight of your faith in conflict with evil. Because evil is going to come your way. Temptation is going to come your way. There are things the devil is going to come your way. Fight for your eternal life. Fight to get to heaven. Uh, you see, your faith isn't passive. You're going to have to learn to fight if you're going to possess all that God has for you. So the question is, why don't we fight? Reasons why you and I don't fight. The number one reason why you and I don't fight is our view of Christianity. See, the truth is we view Christianity, many people view Christianity, you viewed Christianity as a passive religion. We take scriptures or uh, Jesus' words, turn the other cheek, and we assume that every time we should allow people to walk over us, that we are to be uh, on the offensive, uh, we should be on the defensive rather than being on the offensive, that we should just accept things as they are, live peaceably with people. We think that means that I can't be aggressive, uh, I can't pursue the things of God with aggression, uh, and our view of Christianity Christianity is so wrong because that's not the God we serve. All throughout the Old Testament, God says, go into battle. I will be with you. Go and fight them. I will fight for you. And so Christianity is not passive. Paul tells Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. It's not a passive religion. God wants you and I to fight for the things that belong to us. In fact, when, God, uh, when Moses sends the 12 spies, to spy out the land. Here's the children of Israel there in the wilderness. They're just on the verge of entering that promised land. And God says, all right, you're there now. You're almost there. Now I want you to get battle ready. I want you to get ready to fight. All right, so if you're going to get ready to fight, you need to prepare yourself. So go and spy out the land I am going to give you. Why? Because I've promised it, but it's not automatic. Now go and spy it out so you can fight, win the battle, subdue the land, and it's all yours. So what Moses does, he sends 12 spies. They go and spy out the land. They look at the land, and they see that the land is fruitful. Not only is the land fruitful, but they notice the type of people that live there. They're giants. Their walls are huge, fortified walls. And so the 12 spies come back. And they begin to give a report. Numbers chapter 13, verse 27 to 33. Listen to what it says. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore. And indeed, a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. 
Uh, so they show him the fruit, verse 28. But the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, descendants of Anak. Um, the Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Caleb turns around and says, let's go at once to take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land amongst the Israelites. The land we traveled, uh, the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw uh, were huge. Uh, we even saw giants there, the descendants of Enoch. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, uh, and that's what they thought too. So here are these men. They go and view the promise. They go and see the land that God promised to give to them, and they come back, and 10 of them give this amazingly dreadful report. We can't go and fight them. There's giants there. In fact, uh, we looked like grasshoppers in their sight, and we know they thought that too. How do they know that? And they spread this bad report to everyone else, uh, but fear within everyone else, uh, and all of a sudden, the children of Israel lose their will to fight. See, the second reason why you and I don't fight is because we don't believe we're going to win. These spies didn't believe they were going to win. So let's be passive. Let's sit back. Let's pray to God so that God can do it for us. But God had sent them to fight. The third reason why we don't fight is we don't believe the fight is worth it. We don't believe the fight is worth it. Someone once said, if something is worth, if something is worthy, then it's worth fighting for. See, sometimes people don't fight because they don't believe the fight is worth it. Number four, why people don't fight is we have what's called an entitlement mentality. We feel entitled. We think just because we prayed about it, therefore it has to drop from heaven at our feet. We've got this entitlement mentality that we think that everything should be handed to us on a silver platter. That's not how it is. Let me give you an example. There are young men and young women that pray for jobs. You've cried out to God for jobs, uh, and yet you won't. Uh, you, you make an application, and you sit there. You won't even make a phone call to follow up because you don't think you, you think it's just going to fall from heaven. Listen, you're going to have to fight. You can't survive. You can't pursue your purpose and get your purpose by having an entitled mentality. The fifth reason why people don't fight is because of how they see themselves. It's because of how we view ourselves. This man says, we was like grasshoppers in their sight. They viewed themselves as grasshoppers as they look at the giants of uh, the, the Canaanites, the land they were meant to possess. How you view yourselves many a times determine whether, whether you're going to fight or not. And the sixth reason why you and I don't fight is because of our view of God. We think somehow that God will abandon us in the fight. So here we have this text once again, these uh, children of Israel, they are on the verge of the promised land. The spies have told them this uh, defeatist uh, uh, view of going in and possessing the land. And notice what they begin to accuse God of. Numbers chapter 14, verse 3. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Hang on for a second. Pause, the children of Israel. Stop for a minute. Isn't this the same God that rescued you, uh, that rescued you out of Egypt? Isn't this the same God that defeated Pharaoh on your behalf? Isn't this the same God that parted the Red Sea so you can go into your promised land? Isn't this the same God uh, that gave you victory over the Amalekites? Is it not the same God uh, that rained manna from heaven? The same God uh, that broke the rock and brought water to you guys? Is he not the same God? Uh, now he's calling you to fight some giants. Now he's He's calling you to fight for your territory and now you're accusing him of bringing you into this place to die. Notice what they say. Our wives and our little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Then they plotted amongst themselves. 
Let's choose another leader and go back to Egypt. See, if your view of God is a view that God will abandon you or abandon his people, you will never fight in order to possess what God has for you. You will never fight in order to enter into your purpose. They forgot that God fought for them. That as they fought, God also fought for them. See, fear overshadowed their faith rather than their faith overshadowing their fear. See, what stopped many of that first generation of Israelites entering the promised land, destiny and purpose was a lack of fight. You know the story. God then just becomes so vexed with them and says, none of that generation would enter into the promised land except for two, Caleb and Joshua. Here's a quote I read. It says this, life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. God has many promises for you. But if you're going to possess them, you're going to have to learn to fight for them. So how do I fight? So we spoke about why we don't fight. So now how do I fight? This is how I fight. Number one, I anticipate a fight. You're going to have to live your life in anticipation that the enemy of your soul, the enemy of your destiny, the enemy that doesn't want you living your purpose, he's going to attack. He's going to come. He's going to come on the offensive. He's going to come and attack because he does not want you living in your destiny. Here's an amazing truth about my life and Jillian's life. Whenever we have been in transition, going to the next level or even coming to Bolton or when we was about to get this building, there was always resistance. There were always attacks before the victory. There was always attacks before the victory. Why? Because the devil would do whatever he can to stop you and I. I remember before we got married, I remember all the things coming against us. Marriage venue didn't want to have us anymore. We couldn't do this. We couldn't do this. And I remember one time vividly. I remember this so, so vividly. I said to Jillian, Jillian, you go talk to them and I'll be back in my house on, the, on my knees praying. We had an uh, attack plan. We anticipated a fight. Sometimes we need to anticipate that we're going to be in a fight. That the devil is going to come out of us. Be 100% sure about this. He's coming. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 says this, uh, Therefore, put on every piece of armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. In other words, Paul saying, listen, put on the armor. That there is an armor that you ought to put on. How many know? You put on the armor before the battle. You put on an armor in anticipation of a fight. It says to be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. What is the armor to put on? The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, uh, uh, the word of God. In other words, Paul says you need to be preparing for a fight. Because when the enemy comes, he's not coming with an announcement. He's coming when you least expect it. He's coming on the attacker. The children of Israel didn't ask to be attacked, but they were attacked and they had to fight. They were battle ready. Remember, they left with their swords, they left with their shields. Are you battle ready? You need to be able to anticipate a fight. If you're going to fight, number one, anticipate a fight. Number two, accept the fight in faith. Accept the fight in faith. You know, sometimes what we do is we accept defeat before we've even fought. We've already been defeated before we've even picked up our sword of the word of God to fight. We accept defeat way too easy. We accept bad news way too quickly sometimes. We move into depression way too soon. We come up with conclusions before we've even begun the chapter. You see, you're going to have to accept 
the fight in faith. You're going to have to anticipate the fight and accept the fight in faith, knowing, listen, I'm going to have to fight. Even though I might be weaker, even though I might not have what it takes, uh, I'm going to have to accept the fight in faith. The children of Israel, those 10 spies, they accepted defeat before they even fought. You know, let's just say something practical here. You know, some of us, what we do is we accept defeat before we even apply for the job. We read some of the requirements or the things that they want and we see things that we don't have and we write ourselves off. We don't even apply in faith. We don't even send our CVs in faith. We accept defeat before we've even applied. In fact, we make their minds up for them. I'll never get that job. How'd you know? Oh, I'm not qualified. How'd you know? How do you know that when you sit in that interview and you speak to that individual that's interviewing, that then they're going to like you for who you are? That you can't say things that they're going to impress them and give you the job even though you're not qualified. But we accept defeat before we've even sent in the CV. See, even in church, people accept defeat. Oh, I can't lead prayer meeting. I can't lead the impact team. I can't uh, lead the men's group or the women. I can't lead that or the women's group. I can't lead those groups. We accept defeat before we even do anything. See, when the Amalekites attacked the children of Israel, the children of Israel didn't put their hands up and cry. They didn't run away and accept. They didn't run away and say, oh, we're weak. We can't fight. No, the children of Israel accepted the fight. Notice what happens. This is their first fight. Numbers chapter 17, verse uh, 8 to 10. Listen to what happens. The warriors of Amalek attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, choose some men to go up and fight the army of the Amalekites for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill, holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses commanded and fought the, uh, the army of the Amalekites. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed the top of the mountain. Listen, they're the strategy. They accepted the fight. Joshua went down to fight practically. And Moses went on to the top to fight spiritually. They had a point of attacker. They accepted the fight in faith. Not only did they accept the fight, but they aggressively fought. This is the third thing you need. You need to aggressively fight. They took the fight to the Amalekites and to God at the same time. They took the fight to the Amalekites and to God at the same time. Notice verse 11. And as long as Moses, uh, Moses' hands uh, held up the stuff in his, in his hand, the Israelites had the, advant had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hands, the Amalekites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired uh, he could no longer hold them up so Aaron and her found a stone for him to sit on then they stood up on each uh, on each side of Moses holding up his hands uh, so his hands held steadily until sunset as a result Joshua overwhelmed the army of the Amalekites in battle notice what happens here when they go and fight the Amalekites uh, Moses says Joshua you pick up the swords, you pick up the shield, you go and fight them physically, practically. And Moses and Aaron and her went up the hill and Moses raised his hand and the staff as a symbol of prayer. And Aaron and her helped him hold his hands up. In other words, they helped him to pray. And as Joshua was fighting practically, physically, Moses and Aaron and her were fighting spiritually by in praying, speaking to God, you're going to have to learn to do both. That if you're going to aggressively fight for your destiny, fight for your purpose, you're going to have to learn to do both. Pray and be practical. Pray and be practical. When me and Jillian came to Bolton, with your mom and Jeremiah, I rang the library to see whether we could find, uh, we could use their building as church. I picked up the phone, rang them, and they said, no, you can't have church here. I rang Claremont Church and I said, hey, could we hire a building to have church? They said, no, you can't have church there. You know, I didn't give up. I went back again. I went home, 
prayed, God, we need a building to have church. Huh? And I rang the library back again, and they said no. Rang Claremont again, they didn't pick up. Now, I remember praying, God, we need a building to have church. Huh? I remember ringing the library again. Someone else picks up, and they have a conversation with me and ask me to come in to tell them what it is we want to do. And through that conversation, was able to start the church meeting in the library. A year later, the church grew, and we needed someone else to meet. I called Claremont Church, someone else picked up and said, hey, listen, we've got so much space for you. And they accepted us to use their building. You see, they said no before, but we went and prayed and we carried on asking. We went and prayed and carried on asking. You're going to have to learn to be practical and praying at the same time. You know, I love UFC, Ultimate Fighting. I love it. Uh, I can spend a bit of time watching uh, some of the fights. Uh, this is uh, uh, not necessarily bare knuckles, uh, but it's fun. I love watching it. And so UFC has like the, uh, the scoring rules. So uh, you get points for fighting on the ground, right? You get points when you're grappling on the ground. Uh, uh, you get points for, uh, for, for, uh, for punching when you're standing. When you're standing, you're punching. And you get points for being aggressive and, uh, and being the advancer or the, uh, you know, the aggressor. So if you're just backing away, you don't get any points. But if you're aggressive, uh, you get points. And so I began to think about this, that sometimes this is how we ought to fight. We ought to fight on the floor. We ought to fight on our knees in prayer. As we're on our knees, we're crying out to God. That's the first way you and I ought to fight. We ought to fight on our knees. We also have to learn to fight standing, standing on God's promises, saying, God, you promised me. You said this. This is what your word says. I'm going to stand on your promises. You're going to also have to learn to advance, to go in faith, even though it looks blink, even though you don't see the victory. You're going to have to learn to believe. God, uh, that God has victory for you, uh, you're going to be uh, going to have to learn to be on the offensive rather than be on the defensive. Uh, you see, you're going to have to learn to fight on your knees in prayer, standing up on God's promises and advancing in faith. Be on the offensive. And notice what happens next in Exodus chapter 15. So Moses uh, is up uh, top of the mountain. Joshua is fighting on the ground. Uh, they win the battle. And Moses, the Bible says, Moses built an altar there and named it Jehovah Nissi or Yahweh Nissi, which means the Lord is my banner. See, in all this, God got involved. And Moses knew God got involved. That Moses built an altar in remembrance of Jehovah Nissi, the Lord our banner, the God of victory. The Lord is my banner of victory. In other words, he's the one that gave us victory. He's the one that fought for us. See, they discovered something about God when they decided to get involved in a fight. If we stand up and fight, God will stand up and fight for us. The God that leads them into battle led them to victory. See, but I noticed something as I was reading this. Moses doesn't say Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord, our banner. It says Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord, my banner. God is a God that fights for us, but he's a God that fights for you. It is you deciding to pursue your purpose. God will get involved and fight your battles for you. Deuteronomy 20 verse 4 says, For the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you against your enemies and he will give you the victory. See, when God's on your side, you should already know victory is yours. So learn to fight. Fight for your destiny. Fight for your purpose. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your children. Fight for your sanity. Fight for your health. Fight for your business. Fight for your finances. Come on church, fight for your anointing. Fight for your ministry. Fight for your relationships. Fight to keep a right heart. Fight against sin. Fight against temptation. You have to fight if you're going to live in your destiny. Anything worth having in life is worth fighting for. 
See, the greatest battle that was ever fought was for your soul. See, Jesus thought that you was worth fighting for. So he fought for you by dying on the cross. When they crucified him on that cross, and as he bled on that cross, his blood paid the price for your sins. You see, Jesus fought and he won the battle against sin on the cross. You know, when he cried out, it is finished, the Greek tete estae, it meant that it wasn't a cry of defeat, but it was a victorious cry to say that he had won the battle for you. That he had, um, uh, he, had, uh, he had died, shed his blood so Jesus God, so God could forgive you of your sins. See, by dying on the cross, he won the battle against sin. They took him off the cross, buried him in a tomb. But three days later, he rose because he won the battle against death. Paul says he conquered death. Death, where is your sting? Do you know why he conquered death? So that when you and I die, he's able to raise us up again into a new life. Cross for your sins, risen from the dead uh, to give you victory over death. Uh, and the Bible says in the book of Revelation, he's coming back. And when he's coming back, uh, he's coming back to face battle and fight evil and fight those that rejected him, those that chose to live their lives uh, in sin. He's coming back to fight. And guess what's gonna happen? He's gonna win. And the Bible says when he wins, he will have you and I in heaven and he'll create a new earth and a new heaven and we'll be with him for eternity. You see, if you have Jesus in your life, you're on the winning side. And so the question I'm leaving you with this morning is, what side do you want to be on? The winning side or the losing side? Because when you have Jesus, on your side, you're on the winning side. And when you've got God fighting your battles, you surely win. See, if we're gonna live in the purpose that God has for us, we're gonna have to learn to fight. And God promises you and I that he will be with us and he will fight for us and he will give us victories against our enemy. He's Jehovah. Nisi, the Lord our banner in times of victory. Come on, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, I thank you for every promise you've given to us. Father, you pro your promises are yes and amen, meaning they will surely come to pass. Father, give us the faith, the strength to be able to fight for the promises you've given to us, to be able to fight in order to live in our purpose. Father, we're not meant to be passive, but we're meant to be forcefully aggressive, uh, aggressing towards the plan and the purpose you have for us. Father, put some fight in your church. Father, put some fight in our lives. Help us to fight for the things that you've promised and help us to be victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. And I don't know what's going on in your life at the present moment. But I want to encourage you that as Patrick and Yolanda come and lead us in a song of worship, there are some things that you've been battling. And sometimes you feel like you're being defeated. Sometimes you feel like giving up. Sometimes you feel like throwing in the towel. Sometimes you feel like letting things go and just living this peaceable, uh, peaceful life uh, without having any conflict. Uh, but I want to let you know, what if your promise is just around the corner? What if your promise is just a fight away? Church, let's not give up easily. Let's fight for what God has for us. Before we go and before we, uh, we depart, I want to maybe ask, are you on the winning side? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? If you were to die today, would you be vic victorious and make heaven your home? You have a choice today to make, to accept Jesus as your Lord, and Savior or to reject him and if you want to accept him we want to pray for you bow your head and close your eyes and we'll lead you in this prayer just say dear Jesus I thank you that you won the victory for me 
that I can battle sin and win, that you conquered the grave, that I could be resurrected when I die. I ask you forgive me of my sins, come into my life and make me into the person you've always wanted me to be. In Jesus name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, our church details will be on the screen. But you too, right now, why don't you take some time and you begin to speak to God and say, God, there are some battles I'm facing. Help me to be able to fight in order to win so I can live the purpose that you have for me. Come on, let's pray. Listen, have, a, have an amazing week this week. And remember, uh, God's promises are not necessarily automatic and you're going to have to fight in order to possess them. If you pray to receive Jesus this morning, our uh, details are going to be up on the screen. Please send us a message, send us an email, and we'll get some information over to you uh, so you can begin your journey with God uh, this week. And so once again, have an amazing week and we'll see you next week. Surrender.